Welcome to the 700 Club Canada. I'm Brian Warren. And I'm Laura Lynn Tyler Thompson. We love spending this time with you. Mm -hmm. And we've got a powerfully inspiring show in store for you today. Mm. We sure do, Brian. You know, featuring uh, an incredible in-studio interview today with Mark and Cindy Wilkins. You don't want to miss this. Mm -hmm. Now, Cindy will talk about her new book, Shine On, and her journey of faith as a quadruple amputee. That's so stay right. Tuned. A quadruple amputee. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Coming up first, though, a powerful feature story from CBN News, Back from the Dead. Watch. 37-year-old Tony Yaley is thankful he could attend church with his family. Feels great. I was, I was, you know, always a believer, but I mean, it's, it's a whole new level now. In the early morning of August 5th, Tony had difficulty breathing and went into cardiac arrest. It was 4 a.m. Um, the Lord woke me up. There's no other explanation. I don't get up at 4 a.m. Um, something just woke me up, and I heard his breathing. And as a nurse, I knew it was not correct. I turned on the light, tried to wake him up. He wouldn't wake up. I took his pulse. He didn't have a pulse, so then I just went into my training and did CPR. Tony was rushed to the ER at this hospital where he later coded. Doctors worked on him for 45 minutes to save his life. He was later pronounced dead. His family was shocked and heartbroken. I get just dropped and like my stomach dropped. I just didn't know how to feel. I just cried. It was a overwhelming um, shock, a lot of grief. While nurses prepared the body for his family's final viewing, Melissa kept believing for the impossible. My 17-year-old um, cousin, who is a preacher, laid his hand upon me, and the Lord spoke through him, and he said, he called me his child. He, he said a whole lot more, which I don't remember, but he also said, if we would just believe that it would be done. And from that moment on, I knew, I knew he was gonna be all right. Pastor Paul Santoro and his wife Jennifer were at the hospital with Tony's family. Pastor Paul says he had recently been teaching on the power of prayer. The couple had also begun talking to Tony's 17-year-old son, Lawrence, about the things of God. I distinctly remember watching him with his elbows on a desk. And he had his head down and he was praying. And then the word came in and the doctors came in and the, the place erupted with such grief. I'll never forget the sounds of the, the wailing, the screaming, the crying. And uh, Lawrence jumped up and he went to the wall and he just hit the wall just really hard. And I saw Lawrence um, as he was, he was turned to the wall, um, shaking his head, then all of a sudden he straightened up and it was as if he just had the second Wind. Refusing to accept his father's death, Lawrence did something extraordinary. Something just, just clicked, and um, so I just came out and I said, Dad, you're not going to die today. I spoke against the spirit of death in my prayer, and I asked the Lord to give him life and to call him back. And when I did that, Lawrence runs out into the hallway, and we were actually in agreement. He declared that uh, the doctors must not give up hope on his dad. He said that a couple of times, and then he said that his dad, he spoke to his, toward his dad and pointed toward his dad, and he said his dad would live. Immediately, Tony's body began to show signs of life. He fully awakened five days later with no signs of heart damage or defects. I mean, there's so many little things that need to get out there, miracles that happened after that big one that everybody's clinging to, you know? I mean, even down to, you know, me coming out with no broken ribs, not being sore. Hospital officials have no medical explanation for Tony's miraculous recovery. They agree there was divine intervention. I truly think, though, that with the power of all that prayer and all the things that were being done for him is the perfect coalescence of God in our lives and the um, the gifts that he gives us that we should be sharing. News of his resurrection has spread around the world. I just think that we are created by an amazing God, that there's only one answer, God. People who doubt are going to say it's just medical. People who believe say that's just proof of what I already know to be true. Tony says he doesn't remember anything about death, no white light, visions of heaven, and no answers why this happened. But he says his faith is stronger and more real than ever. God steps in when man can do no more. 
and they had literally came to the end and said, we can do no more. You know, they pronounced me dead, and that's when he came. The family also want people to worship God, not the miracle. Our God is an awesome God. Charlene Israel, CBN News, Dayton, Ohio. Laurel, and that is definitely encouraging. Not even a broken rib. And uh, right. when you start seeing the, the prayer coming together and all of these things, mm. uh, the resurrection. Yes. Well, you we're know, living in those days. We are. Um, I was thinking about what you said once. Uh, we were talking about Lazarus, the story of Lazarus. And mm -hmm. you said, how much faith did it take for Lazarus to be raised from the dead? Nothing. Yes. Right? Zero. Yes. And it was kind of like this guy's situation. You know what I mean? Like things happen and, you know. You know, it, it also goes to show you as well because uh, Tony had no idea what took place. He had, right. he was oblivious. Yeah. But everyone else was engaged and right. everyone else was praying. And it just shows you when mm. we begin to partner with God. Yes. And, you know, I've, I've said this many times that uh, the reason why God puts our asking in Him giving and it's inseparable because he wants to partner with us and to make sure that it's not just God doing something, mm -hmm. like treating us like robots, but right. giving us an opportunity to be partners with God. Right, like it's a relationship, you know, yeah. that's why God hears prayers because right. he's like, I'm in relationship with you. So all those people praying, I'm hearing that prayer, okay, yes. you know, because I love you, because I want to pour my blessings on you. I'm going to, you know, come into agreement with your prayer. Prayer is so important and, uh, you know, um, and isn't it great that even when we're incapacitated, let's say we're in a coma or something, God's still operating on our behalf Absolutely. because we can't come into agreement with him, but all of these people around us and our loved ones, God's so powerful. I felt during this time that somebody, you probably need this, hope. And it costs you absolutely nothing. If you call the number on the screen, we'll get it to you as quickly as possible. But I, I want you to be encouraged that just like Tony, you have a loved one that's in the hospital, you have a, an issue or a circumstance that seems too big for you, don't stop praying and don't give up on God because he won't give up on you. Mm, good word. Coming up in 30 seconds, a drunk driver plows into a church van full of children. And Roddy Turner is first on the scene. Don't go. get to the accident site and I'll never ever forget what I saw. Uh, the van's over in a ditch. Uh, it's all torn in, bashed in, and I just begin to weep. Roddy Turner pastors a church in the small town of Martin, Georgia. For years he has trusted Audrey Cowles with the van ministry, driving children to and from church each week. When somebody wants to come to church, you're going to try to make a way. It's something to reach the children, and they wanted to come, and so and it's a good place to come to, reach, you know, to serve God. The week before Easter 2015, Audrey drove a van full of children home from church when they were hit by a drunk driver. We start flipping, flipping. I guess it had to be two or three times or more. And the only thing I could say, Lord, when is this going to stop? and then just landing perfectly in the grass, all the way on the other side of the road. One child had been ejected from the vehicle as it rolled. Her condition and the condition of the others was unknown. She was out the window under the, under the tire. Everything was crashed, all the windows was busted out. Is the kids all right? They were back there hollering and screaming. I told them to calm down, calm down. Everything was gonna be all right. I didn't see no blood and I didn't see anything because I couldn't hardly turn to see what was going on in the back. But I was just praying that everything would have been all right. Meanwhile, Pastor Roddy got a call about the crash. He raced to the scene and saw the wrecked van. I can barely see part of it, but I can see it's caved in. I can see the roof is pressed down. Broken glass and parts of 
the truck and parts of the van all over the road. It really looked terrible. I thought somebody had died. Our sheriff was there and he told me that they had already airlifted some to other hospitals out of town. One helicopter was still at the scene with a little girl inside. And so I walked up to look into that helicopter and I spoke to the little girl and called her by name and reached up and put my hand on her and prayed with her and told her everything was gonna be okay. And uh, that was traumatic. I didn't know she was gonna live. Soon after, Pastor Roddy gathered the church deacons together to pray. All I had was a lot of unknowns. I knew there were injuries. I didn't know how many were life-threatening. And we just, uh, we just prayed. We just prayed. Later that day and into the next, information about the condition of the children was released. By the next day, everybody had been released from the hospital. Everybody had gone home. We had a broken finger and we had a broken arm. That was the severity of the injuries. The only way I can see it is that it was divine protection. There were people that should have died there. That day, I knew there was a God. I knew that he can do anything. God, you know, he had it. He had everything in his hands. And if you got God on your side, you don't have to worry about anything because he's going to take care of it. Just a week after the crash, the church celebrated Easter with their annual children's production. We call it the Martin Miracle. And that's what it is. God gets all the credit. To him be all the glory and the praise. All the children that were in the van, plus our other children in the children's choir, were right up here on this stage singing for Jesus. Amazing. And their parents were here and family was here. You talking about celebrating. It was a wonderful time. We cried. We just thanked the Lord. It was beautiful. Wow, what a powerful testimony. You know, life can turn on a dime. You, you're going one way and, and you're going in a, uh, a direction and then all of a sudden it seems to shift. Uh, Pastor Roddy, he said something. He said, when I came on the scene, all I could do is just weep when I looked at the van and the ditch and torn completely apart. I wonder what you're looking at right now, but I got a word from the Lord and I believe that the Spirit of God would say, do not judge according to the circumstance, but confess right now that you are blessed. You know, the Bible says in Romans 8, 28, and, and we know that all things work together for the good of those that love God and are the called according to his purpose. When you begin to lock up on God's purpose, when you begin to come into agreement and saying, God, I don't understand it, but I know that you've got this. That's the point where things now shift because that's where burdens change shoulders and you can begin to come into a place of absolute peace, resting in God's assurance that he's going to bring this through. I want to pray with you right now as we close out in this time because I feel like the Spirit of God is saying, Romans 8, 28 is for you. Father, you know the situation. And as we go into Easter, just like every one of those children were unharmed and they walked out, I declare that your child is going to get through this and they're going to say, I never thought that it would look like this and they won't look like what they've gone through. Bless them now in Jesus name, amen. Well, Laura Lynn sits down with Mark and Cindy Wilkins live in studio after this, don't go away. Sometimes life can feel like living under a dark cloud. The constant drip of difficulties can seem overwhelming, like you're drowning in your problems. But even in the darkest times, there is a solution. It brings light and hope and will change your world. Discover the power that comes through knowing how to pray effectively in Pat Robertson's latest teaching, Answered Prayer. Call now and learn how to get answers to your prayers.
Welcome back. My guests today are uh, Mark and Cindy Wilkins, and you are going to be intrigued and love their story and also feel the pain that they've been through. The book is called Shine On, and I was blessed to be able to do the foreword. Um, it was a difficult forward because as I began to get engrossed into your story, I realized that you had faced something that few of us would ever want to face. And Cindy, thank you for sharing uh, what has gone on. Uh, before I talk to Mark about sort of your role in this, because you've been through this as a couple, uh, Cindy, we can tell that you have had your arms amputated and as well uh, b below your knees. Yes, yes, right. my feet are amputated. And so what was the initial uh, reason that this had to be done? Well, um, about seven years ago, I was on maternity leave with my son, who was three months old, and our adopted daughter, who was five years old, and um, came down with symptoms that seemed like the flu, but were far more aggressive. Under the impression that it was the flu, I was rushed to emergency, where um, I presented in um, renal failure and septic shock and uh, mm -hmm. my kidneys and liver were shutting down. And Mark arrived to the hospital to find out that uh, I had contracted a bacterial infection mm -hmm. and uh, that I likely would not make it through the night. Wow. And so subsequent to that, um, uh, you actually went into a coma? They medically induced a coma. Right. And I don't really remember much after that. Yes. And so, Mark, mm -hmm. w while she's in a coma, you're dealing with all of this uh, on your own, and right. then it went from bad to worse. Uh, yes. Uh, so, um, just to talk about uh, that, that night in emergency, the, the head doctor pulled me aside and said, we're not sure if your wife's going to make it through the night. Uh, we need you to sign off and, and inducing her into a coma so she can fight for her life. And uh, you should be calling everybody who loves Cindy and get them down here to say their last goodbyes. Wow. And so in they, that moment, what, what were you feeling? I was just going from moment to moment in shock, really. Yeah. To be honest with you. I, uh, mm. they, they took Cindy up to ICU and I made my phone calls. And I went into the waiting room in ICU. And oddly, it was completely quiet. There was no one in there but me. And, uh, I, and a Bible beside me on the table. And at that point in my life, I called myself a Christian, but I wasn't saved. And uh, mm. I looked at the Bible and said, if, if I'm a Christian and, and if I need God, which I do right now, and my wife needs him right now, I better start reading. Wow. And that's when I started reading the Bible for the first time. And uh, mm. He doesn't mention that he picked it up and read the book of Revelation first. <laughs> oh, Revelation. I wanted to get to the ending. <laughs> right. So I knew, you know, how, how does how this the, end? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. So you have this epiphany and you awaken to go. I mean, there's nothing like a real crisis, is there, right. for us to go, you know, we ha I haven't prayed to you for, for a long time, but I'm praying right now. Right. And so then you got even worse news. Right. Um, so a couple of days into it, actually, yeah, they, they came back with testing and said Cindy had necrotizing fasciitis, mm. uh, flesh-eating disease, and uh, that's why her limbs were dying and... Uh, and whatnot, and uh, they, they actually said that everybody who was in contact with Cindy uh, over the last few weeks would have to be contacted by me. They would have to be given the specific uh, prescription from their doctors to ensure that they wouldn't get it. And uh, that was on a Sunday, and it was about 3 o'clock, and uh, they said, you need to get your kids to a walk-in clinic right now so they can get tested and so you can get prescriptions. And uh, so I had to rush them over to... Uh, to get the prescriptions. Um, a couple of days later, those tests came back and my daughter was positive, but thank the Lord that we got the medication to her in time. Wow. And no one else contracted it. Right. Thank God. And because of this, the doctors eventually told you, we are going to have to amputate. Correct. And did you have to make that decision? I did make that decision. I, I, I got a call one night at, at about midnight, oddly. Yeah. I was at home trying to get some rest and uh, the doctor said, Mark, we've made a decision. Uh, we have to amputate Cindy's hands and feet, and uh, we need you to sign off on that. We need oh. your permission to do so. And uh, they said it was uh, absolutely essential. They couldn't save any of mm. her limbs. And, and as uh, a husband, your, your wife's in a coma. You're making right. these big decisions. Right. You never thought in life you'd have to face something like that. It was, yeah, it was, it was surreal, the whole experience, for sure. Right. Did you feel the God that you were now crying out to? Did, did you feel him close at that time, or was it just... 
I, I was still getting to know God, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, about two and a half weeks into Cindy being in a coma, it was looking really bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, there wasn't a whole lot of hope around. And I came home one night uh, from the hospital and uh, we had friends and family looking after our kids. A friend of mine pulled me aside and said, uh, Mark, we've been talking and we know you have a lot going on. You probably haven't thought about this, but you should think about pulling the plug on Cindy. I had had renal failure, kidney, liver, heart failure, and respiratory failure. Wow. And it looked like there was a high chance of brain damage. And wow. th these are the things my friend is reiterating back to me. And, uh, and I, at that point, I never really thought that this was a decision I had to make about my wife's life. Right. And I went back in the car, drove to the hospital. It was midnight. They let me into ICU. I'm crying. And I said my first real honest prayer to, to God, at, right beside Cindy on the floor. And I said, God, I need to know if Cindy wants to live, if she wants to die, if, if she needs more time, or if I should pull the plug, I, I wow. need you to tell me. Oh, and, what a place to be. And then the next day, I'm back at the hospital, having lunch with some friends who were visiting Cindy with me, and uh, my phone rang. I let it go to voicemail. And I checked the voicemail after lunch, and it was my mother-in-law, and who never calls me, my sweet little old mother-in-law, and said, Mark, I'm to give you a message. You're gonna think I'm crazy, but I've heard voices all morning saying, Cindy wants to live, she doesn't wanna die, she needs more time, don't pull the plug, wow. and tell Mark. Hmm. And so I've just told you, okay, bye, and she hung up. <laughs> oh my goodness, <laughs> wow. So God was just speaking to you and giving you things. So eventually, Cindy, you come out of a coma, yeah. and you are told by your husband the reality of the situation. What is the impact on a wife and a mother well, at that? Yeah, you would know. The first thing I would think of was my children. Yeah. And I, I couldn't imagine what I would do. How would I braid my daughter's hair, make them lunches? How would I hold my son in my arms? And um, I was connected to tubes and wires, and I, I had to process what my future looked like. Yeah. My mother had raised me um, to believe that God could do anything, and she always had devotionals around the house. And as a little girl, I had fallen in love with Jesus, but trials in life had pulled me away. But in that moment, I knew it was him that could carry me through. Right. And it was him that I would have to, have to allow to help me overcome. It's the kind of trial uh, that, um, where you know you can't rely on Mark. I mean, what can he do? The doctors, you know, they're, they've done all they can and you have to survive with a yeah. devastating diagnosis and, and results from all of this. Yeah. So you found in your heart, I gotta go to God. He's the only one. It was as if Jesus had walked into the room. I heard the first piece of scripture, which was Psalm 139. Mm -hmm. um, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And I, ha I was compelled in my heart, this overwhelming feeling that God could have created me for this very moment. Wow. And that- Created you for this for moment. This, to be ready for it. And I knew that if he had created me to be ready for it, and he was the one who was going to carry me through this tragedy, oh. then I needed to let him do that. And so for the first time at the end of myself, I placed myself in front of him. And I stopped, I stopped wondering what would happen and started grieving in faith that he would carry me through. Wow. And he did. And he did, but it was quite a journey. So as you began healing, what, what were some of the things that you had to deal with as a couple? Because mm. everything changed. Right. Your wife didn't have the full use of her arms or her legs. Correct. And you, as a woman, had to deal with all of that. Yeah, and there were periods in time where he could only carry me from room to room when I came home on the weekends. And uh, there were yeah. so many moments where we would just look at each other crying and yeah. saying, How are we gonna get this through this? This is so <laughs> difficult. Right. But this. we took it day by day and... Uh, Did you ever feel angry at God? Uh, you know, I never felt angry at God mm -hmm. for it. I, I felt sadness and I felt that, you know, we will get through it. Mm. And, uh, and once I knew God was in control, Mm, that um, was the key. That we weren't in control and that all we could do was put our complete faith and trust in him.
Right. Um, it, it took a lot of the fear away. Mm -hmm. And it was just, you know, looking for those cues, looking for God giving us the direction that we needed. I think this gives hope to anyone out there that's facing something that's surely not as bad. This on, on the scale has to be one of the worst things you could go through. Now, uh, there was a point as God was healing you, Cindy, that he, just revelations began to come to your heart about your identity and who you were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were many moments, um, moments in which I knew that if I was speaking this story and telling people about it, that it would have a great impact on them facing trial and that, you know, it doesn't matter what trial it is, that, that if we just place our faith in Christ, He can carry us through. And eventually I would learn how to drive and I would learn how to take care of my children and even change a diaper um, and do all the things that a hands-on mom can do. And every day still I have to walk across icy patches and I need to hold, have him hold my hand and give me strength in order to do that. So he is with me all the time. Right. And in a way, you found a reconnection through this tragedy in mm -hmm. your marriage mm -hmm. even. Like it, it's all around a miraculous story. Yeah, yeah we've been very blessed. Mm. Our, uh, our marriage is strong and we have God in it now. Yes. And that's... I would say it's probably stronger than it was before. Yeah. Wow. Because he is in it. Well, if that doesn't inspire all of us, thank you for sharing this very, very difficult story. The book is Shine On. I hope you'll pick it up. And, and you're speaking as well now yes. about this. Yes. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm, I'm blessed. I know if God can be with this beautiful couple through that kind of tragedy, he can be with me and you through what we're going through. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. To contact us, phone 1-855-759-0700. You can email us at cba at 700club.ca. You can now like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter or Instagram. On tomorrow's show... One day while attending his stepdaughter's soccer practice, he met another dad, a pastor who invited him to church. I said, I'm going to tell you why I don't go to church. I said, I'm a witch. I believe in Wicca. And he just looked, he looks at me and he says, well, how's that working out for you? And I said, not too good.